Hey, welcome to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast, episode 79, GI Medications, Pharmacology, and Mnemonics. So let's just talk a little bit about the ulcer, and uh, then we'll get on with it. So the big thing is that, you know, once you get this ulcer, you can't really fix it as much as you can create an environment for it to heal. And so the number of things that you can do to kind of do that include you know, eradicating H. pylori, which is found in, you know, greater percentage of the ulcers, uh, smoking cessation, uh, alcohol, um, you know, reducing stress, spicy food, all those things can help. Uh, but again, making it so that uh, the body can heal itself. So what are some drugs that cause ulcers? So again, alcohol, it's a drug. Uh, so um, ETOH, um, ethanol, uh, then bisphosphonates like adlendronate, ibandronate, again, watching for those stems. Uh, the NSAIDs, ibuprofen, naproxen. Uh, even though Celebrex or Celecoxib is supposed to do it less, it still can be a problem. And then steroids like prednisone. So we, we start with things that we could maybe not use uh, a medication for uh, to help, you know, deal with these kind of GI symptoms and issues and make things better. And so we'll use the mnemonic SAFER, S-A-F-E-R, for smoking, alcohol, food diary, exercise, reducing stress. Uh, and NSAIDs, I, I didn't really know how to put that in there because we're taking away a drug. So is that non-drug? So sort of. So I just had a little breathe image here uh, for smoking. Uh, alcohol, just kind of reducing that have your coffee instead. Uh, here's your food diary. Uh, then, you know, getting some exercise, reducing some stress, yoga, whatever it takes. Uh, but all the things that would make it so that, you know, there's less acidic environment. And of course, not using the NSAIDs if possible. Uh, antacids, you are probably familiar with these colorful, uh, chalky tasting limestone things. And the big thing to know about antacids first is that they're the only drug whose generic name is their chemical name. So calcium carbonate is Tums, aluminum hydroxide is half of Maalox. It's really Amphigel. Uh, and then magnesium hydroxide would be milk of magnesia. So when we talk about antacids, what we're really looking at is which ones are constipating, which ones cause diarrhea. And you kind of have a little guess which is which here. So pick C or D. And with calcium carbonate, that one is constipating. Aluminum hydroxide is constipating. Again, it's uh, Amphigel is going to be the brand name, but if you mix them together, magnesium hydroxide and aluminum hydroxide, it makes Maalox. And then magnesium hydroxide, milk of magnesia. So which causes constipation, which causes diarrhea? So the idea is calcium carbonate is constipating, aluminum hydroxide constipating, magnesium hydroxide causes diarrhea. So if we mix constipating drug like aluminum and a diarrhea causing one like magnesium hydroxide, then we end up with something that is more comfortable for the patient. All right. H2 blockers. I've talked about the antihistamines no man where uh, one nose so that you remember that H1 antihistamines are the ones that are in the nose for allergies and H2, the buttons by his stomach. Uh, those are H2 blockers. So H2 blockers all end in tadine. So famotidine is pepsid and now Zantac uh, used to be ranitidine. Nizatidine is axid and cimetidine is tagamet and ranitidine is Zantac. But again, there's a reason I put them in this order. And the reason is that it's the ones that we prefer versus the ones that we don't. And the reason we don't is because of side effects. So cimetidine uh, can interact with diazepam, lidocaine, phenytoin, propranolol, warfarin can cause gynecomastia. Uh, and then ranitidine, the problem with the NDMA, uh, had it pulled off the shelves. Uh, proton pump inhibitors, it's prazole ending. Uh, and then you might see omeprazole with S-omeprazole and lansoprazole with dexlansoprazole. And wondering, those look awfully the same. What, what's different? And we're really talking about either changing the rotation of plane polarized light or an enantiomer, uh, more of an organic chemistry thing. But basically, there's a mirror image, uh, and the active one is the one that uh, became the new drug. But you know, just having the active one versus having the mix of the active and inactive doesn't necessarily make it better. 
Uh, so uh, a lot of times like Dexalent hasn't really taken over for Prevacid and Nexium, maybe to some extent over Prilosec. So be careful here because the Prezole, it's not Azole. You go on the internet and you find these drug cars and they say, oh, if it ends in Azole, it's a proton pump inhibitor. That is false. If it ends in Prezole, it might be a proton pump inhibitor. But if it ends in Conazole, it's actually an antifungal. So fluconazole, which is diflucan, voriconazole, which is VFEND, both of those are antifungals. So it's not the azole ending. And then aripiprazole, which is abilify, and brexpiprazole, which is rixalti, uh, those are antipsychotics. So really rare to see a stem within a stem that the prazole is in piprazole. Uh, the you know, World Health Organization frowns on such thing, uh, and it's really rare. Uh, but just be careful. Make sure that, you know, if you're looking at something, you know, is it antifungal with conazole? Is it an antipsychotic with piprazole? Or is it a proton pump inhibitor with prazole? So gobs of side effects. Gobs is our mnemonic for gastroenteritis. And you're going to reduce the acidity, which is great for that ulcer, but it also allows bacteria to have a chance to thrive. Osteoporosis, uh, B for B12 deficiency and S for secretion rebound. So once you stop taking that proton pump inhibitor, uh, acid can rebound quite a bit. So G-O-B-S is our mnemonic. Uh, H. pylori therapy, there are many therapies. I just put a couple examples of triple and quad therapy. So triple therapy is going to be two antibiotics and one acid reducer. So amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and esomeprazole makes ACE, A-C-E, as the first letter of each of those drugs. Amoxicillin, clarithromycin, the antibiotics, esomeprazole, the acid reducer, or amoxicillin, metronidazole, and omeprazole. So amoxicillin, metronidazole, the antibiotics, omeprazole, the acid reducer. Again, we want to reduce resistance, so we use lower doses of more drugs. Now we can make a quad therapy here where we actually use you know, three antibiotics and one acid reducer. So a tetracycline like doxycycline, uh, that's not the brand name, it's a tetracycline. So uh, I should have really put tetracycline, comma, doxycycline, and then put the brand names in the, the parentheses. Uh, that's an antibiotic, omeprazole or prilosex is an acid reducer. Metronidazole is flagyl, which is an antibiotic. and Bismuth subsalicylate, when put in this situation, has antimicrobial effects. So uh, I put TUM as the mnemonic, tetracycline T, omeprazole O, metronidazole M, B for bismuth, because once this group comes together, it's curtains for H. pylori. So it would be buried in a TUM. Uh, misoprostol or cytotec. So if you think of it as misoprotect all from NSAIDs, it's really what it does. And I was just thinking of miso soup, mm, delicious. Uh, but that's the, the thing I, I could think of, but misoprostol. And it prevents NSAID-induced ulcers, but it also can be used as a medication absorb, abortion, labor induction, cervical ripening. Uh, it's a prostaglandin analog. So we see the prost in the misoprostol, and it is pregnancy category X. If you're not trying to use it for any of the above uh, indications, you don't want to risk it with a patient. And that's why it's fallen out of favor. You, when you have a medication that could you know, harm a fetus, you really try to find something different. I'm going to clopramid or propulsid. Again, we don't really see the brand names, but see the soccer ball being propelled through the goal. So gastroparesis is usually what the issue is. So that kind of stomach that just will not empty. So it empties much faster and it's a prokinetic. So pro meaning toward and, or, you know, kind of helping out and then kinetic like kinesiology movement. So it is for movement. The problem is, is that some of its mechanism is dopamine antagonist. So dopamine antagonist can result in extrapyramidal symptoms, EPS, and the problem with that is that if someone has Parkinson's and they have a dopamine deficiency, the last thing you want to do is block the dopamine they do have. So uh, what we want to do is make sure to tell the patient about that EPS and possibilities that come along with it, but rarely used medication. Uh, sucralfate, 
or carafate. It sugar coats the crater is how I remember it. Uh, it's a GERD add-on. So a physician might say, okay, well, let's give you, you know, Prilosec for the month and we'll give you a couple weeks of the sacrophate so that with each meal, uh, we're putting that coating down. Uh, it coats the ulcers in that kind of sugary uh, coat. Um, it can cause bezoars, which is really kind of like, it's just a, a knotted ball of stuff. Uh, it can be broken up uh, or surgically removed. Um, and then the the big issue is, this isn't a, a absolute contraindication, but uh, if you're a diabetic and you're taking four sugar pills a day, just have to account for that in however you're reducing the sugar in your bloodstream. And then it's four times a day before meals. So again, getting that sugar uh, may not be the best thing. So if you can think of sacrophate or carophate as a kind of candy, uh, you can remember the concerns about diabetes. Uh, this information is provided for you for your informational purposes only and not intended to provide and should not be relied upon for medical or any other advice. I urge readers to consult with a medical professional with any medical condition. Thanks again for listening to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast.